Welcome to Great Comedic Minds by Kara Robertson, a podcast where we meet some of the greatest comedic creators of our time and find out their real stories. From your favorite TV shows, movies, and live stand-up, we interview the storytellers and joke writers who have entertained us for years to find out exactly how and why they do it. And now, here's your host, Kara Robertson. I'm here with Mike Reese. He is a New York-based comedy writer, published author, and podcast creator. He's been writing for the hit TV show, The Simpsons, since 1989. Mike and his writing partner, Al Jean, were members of the original writing staff for the show and helped create what is one of the most watched shows in history. He has won four Primetime Emmy Awards for his work on the show. Mike's other projects include The Critic, Queer Duck, and he's also worked on screenplays including Ice Age, Dawn of the Dinosaurs, The Simpsons Movie, My Life in Ruins, and many others. He's recently published a book called Springfield Confidential and speaks about his adventurous travels with his wife, Denise, on his podcast, what am I doing here? Thank you so much for joining us today, Mike. It's really great to have you. Oh, it's really fun. Thank you. What to, is it nine o'clock there? Something like that? It is one o'clock in the morning. Oh, you poor thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's 10 a.m. and I felt I felt resentful. I had to get up this early. So. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so you grew up in Bristol, Connecticut, is that correct? Yes, I did. It's a little manufacturing town. It was a town that, uh, uh, it was a blue collar town and they just made uh, ball bearings and brass and springs there. It's not the kind of town uh, Jewish comedy writers come out of that much. Is that what your parents did? Did they work in the, um, with the manufacturing? No, my dad was a doctor and uh, he, he grew up in Brooklyn. He grew up in New York. And when he got out of med school, he just drove around looking for a small town that needed a young doctor. And he stumbled on this place. And uh, the only interesting thing about it is it is a town so much like Springfield on The Simpsons. I really have gotten to use a lot of what I grew up with uh, on the Simpsons. It is just, it, it is, it's a small suburban town. It was named one of the 10 worst small towns in America. Uh, and, but I loved it. I found it was a very nice place full of nice people, but, uh, didn't have a lot going for it. And literally every single person I grew up with got out of there. Nobody's, I have nobody left in Bristol anymore. So did you draw on uh, experience, you mentioned it's a small town, so with the blue collar workers, you drew on uh, your experiences there growing up? Yes, I mean, you know, again, my dad was a doctor, but all my friends' fathers were Homer Simpson. And I guess there's something in the very first episode, the Simpsons uh, Christmas special, the very first episode, about three minutes in, is just something I saw happen where... Uh, my friend Kyle was playing a, a, a board game with his father and his father got mad and lost and uh, threw the board game in the fireplace and started burning it. And that that's exactly, I think, the first scene ever in The Simpsons. Then you went, you went to Harvard for university. I heard there you're ejected from a creative writing class. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Um, they everyone had to take expository writing some sort of writing class at harvard and you had many choices and uh one of them was in creative writing and i applied for that and harvard rejected me and you know <laughs> anyone who's read anything about me knows i hate everything about harvard i think starting with that first and dignity and it just shows they don't they don't know what they were doing and a very, an interesting thing, they put me in theory and practice writing. They put me in this class I didn't want to be in about that teaches you how to write term papers. And John Vitti, another Simpsons writer, original Simpsons writer, uh, was in the same class. I didn't know him. It was a small class. But I thought, I guess they thought he was not uh, qualified to be a creative writer either. 
wonder who uh, judged that, who was the person who wanted to say And then that, someone's going to be very, I'm going to try and tell the story without using his name. There is a brilliant guy who also wound up writing for The Simpsons and Futurama, uh, really one of the smartest guys I know and a terrific writer. Um, and they did, they put him, they tested him and put him in English as a second language. They put him in the class, uh, you know, for students uh, from other countries and the other country he's from is Texas. So that's it. It's the first real decision Harvard made and I thought they really blew it. You were co-president for the Harvard Lampoon? I was co-president yeah. with John Beatty for my expository writing class. Because um, I hear a lot about the Harvard Lampoon, but um, I don't really know much about it. And it seems to be where a lot of um, the writers came from. Yes, about half our Simpsons writers come out of the Harvard Lampoon. Um, it's uh, Greg Daniels, the creator of The Office, came out of there, Conan O'Brien. There's it's uh, just to put it in a little time perspective. At the time I was on the Lampoon, which was like 78 to 81, nobody became a professional writer. Nobody went into comedy uh, from working on the Harvard Lampoon. It was just a school activity. It was just a fun thing you did instead of classes and was never considered a pathway to Hollywood. Uh, but a guy named Andy Borowitz, the year before me, uh, actually a very, very smart, clever guy, got a job offer in Hollywood, and he went out there, and he wound up creating Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and it just sort of woke up the rest of us, <clears throat> and um, so the year after, Al Jean and I wound up in Hollywood really by accident, and that started the parade. Someone called it the black tie invasion uh, because we have a lot of formal parties at the Harvard Lampoon. Uh, but it's, it's probably a hundred writers and I'm very proud of them. It's a, it's a, it's a very new thing, but uh, they do really good work for the most part. They're not just writers that are, they're doing some of the quality shows. Uh, uh, there was one year uh, seven shows were nominated for the Emmy for best sitcom and five of them were run by these Harvard Lampoon graduates. So people like the stuff they're doing, stuff like Curb Your Enthusiasm and Barry and Silicon Valley and uh, The Good Place. Yeah, they're all great shows. The Good Place. Um, where did you meet Al Jean? Was that at Harvard? Yes, I met yeah. Al Jean. Freshman week of Harvard, I, it was a very, very funny meeting where I was sitting in my dorm room and Al is just walking by and the door was open and he sees a rocking chair in the room. And he said, is that a rocking chair? I said, yeah. He said, can I rock in it? I said, okay. And he came in and just sat in that rocking chair and Al Jean rocks he has whatever he likes to rock in a rocking chair and he was 16 years old Al Jean again a very extremely brilliant guy with a 180 IQ and he had gotten into Harvard at 16 and he'd skipped two grades and he was a little lost and he needed to rock in a rocking chair so he rocked for a while and left and uh, uh, he became uh, one of my best friends freshman year and uh, uh, then we roomed together the next year. And Al was going to be a doctor. He was, he was pre-med and he was a math major. And I had gotten on the Harvard Lampoon and he saw that I was really enjoying it. And he decided he was going to join the Harvard Lampoon. This was something he had never had any intention of doing. But again, he was, he's just so smart. He just set his mind to it and got on. I should mention, I talk about all these people on the Harvard Lampoon. Uh, one reason they're such a great bunch of writers is it's really, really hard to get on the Lampoon. It is, it's not a club. It's, a, it's not something you just walk in or anything like that. It is a competition uh, where you have to write, they ask you to write six original comedy pieces in eight weeks. 
And that's hard. It's hard. It's a lot of stuff. You have to hit these deadlines. They don't give you any guidance. You have to be kind of a self-starter. And then they're just ruthless about uh, cutting people. So every semester, 100 people would try out and seven people would get elected. And virtually nobody would get on the first time they tried out. I, I, went, I, tr I was in the competition freshman year. I did not get on. Uh, the next semester, I tried out again, and uh, if I hadn't gotten on that semester, I was going to leave Harvard. And Harvard had no other appeal to me except the Lampoon. Uh, if I hadn't gotten on, I probably would have changed schools, and I'd be a, be a dentist now, and I'd, I'd be on one of those dental podcasts. But that was it. I got on, it, and obviously, it changed my life. So it was uh, like about writing, do they want you to write good comedy or just good writing or a combination of the two? They were just very, very selective. I mean, you just wanted to read something original and funny. That was it. And uh, and they were prose pieces, which is very still really hard, a hard thing to make funny. Um, but that was it. I, I, uh, I, I learned a lot. I think I learned a lot between the first and second competition. There's something that, you know, because we're talking to young comedy writers and comedy professionals, there's a one a huge lesson you got to learn in working in comedy, which is comedy seems fun. It seems fun and easy. And so you think, oh, gee, I can just kind of waltz in here and be funny. But it's really hard work. It is tremendously hard work. And you got to remember that a lot of comedy, young comedy writers get a job and they just screw around like class clowns and they may even be funny in the room. But it's hard to remember, even though you're doing kind of a, a weird and crazy thing for a living. It's a job. You got to work really hard. Yeah, I could obviously getting um, when you talk about being the funny person in the room and then getting that into an actual script that has structure, character development and all that sort of thing would be um, a challenge. Yes. Yes, it is. I mean, uh, that's it. I, I uh, you would ask me before the podcast about playing, you know, one of these games that, you know, you, you hear on a lot of podcasts, you know, think of this and do this and what would I'm always getting these calls. What would Homer say about the Ukraine invasion? And what would Milhouse say about it? And I don't think that fast. That's the reason I'm a comedy writer and not a comedian. I'm not really that good on my feet. And I like to have the time to think about things and come up with the best answer instead of the quickest answer. Have you had a go at stand up before? Yes. Um, uh, it was funny, and it all ties in. Uh, freshman year of college, they were having a talent show, and they needed an MC. And uh, Al Jean comes to me. He said, "We need an MC. Uh, we thought I thought you should do it. You're funny." And I swear to God, no one had ever said that to me before. I go, "Well, really? You think I'm funny? You know, uh, I I just didn't know. I never gave it a thought." So. Uh, so I wrote a stand-up routine, and uh, again, I worked <laughs> to the exclusion of all my classes. I worked really, really hard on this stand-up routine, and I, I became the MC of the talent show. I'd never been on stage before, and it went well. It went pretty well. I was very surprised, and uh, I'm a very shy guy, but I had confidence in the material, and... Uh, and I knew how to tell it. So I got up there and uh, it, and it was a brutal talent show. It went three hours and I had to keep getting up there and fill time. And I had prepared a lot of interstitial material. So I came in prepared. And at the end of the show, the judge of the talent show said, hey, you're really funny. And so I married her and that has been my wife of 33 years. And uh, the poor thing has been hearing the same jokes all these years since. But that was a very important night to me. And I always, I love telling this story, uh, which is there was one other comedian in the talent show and he bombed 
he bombed so badly uh, that afterwards I told him, I said, gee, Paul, maybe comedy is not your thing. So Paul, he went into drama and he wound up creating the show House about the doctor and created the show Bull. And uh, he's now worth half a billion dollars. And I think, <laughs> I think uh, if, if he had done better that first night, uh, he, he'd be here talking on some comedy podcast. <laughs> Oh, well, three hours is a long time to MC for. Like, you oh, it was yeah. just endless. I mean, it was, you know, somebody would get up and say, I'm going to play a guitar, you know, to play the guitar. And then they do three songs. There'd been no rehearsal and no vetting. And people just went and went and went. So it may still be going on for all I know. You said Al Jean was studying to be a doctor. Did he quit? that to do uh, comedy writing or did he finish that? He, uh, I don't remember. What I, what I know is that he got on the Harvard Lampoon and loved it and immediately all his grades went south. He had been an A student and then he was, he was not an A student. Uh, he really went for it in a big way. So I don't recall, I, I think he probably met all his requirements and then, uh, didn't apply anywhere, didn't apply to med school. Just wondering I mean, if, um... Just to, to, to go ahead in the story. So Al and I are writing for the Harvard Lampoon. And one day we get a call from National Lampoon. And that'll probably mean nothing to anybody. But um, back in the 70s, especially 70s and early 80s, National Lampoon was the one outlet for adult humor in America. It was a, a satirical magazine and uh, it was hugely influential and it was it was genius when it was great. And uh, I get this call from National Lampoon and they said, we've been reading your stuff in the Harvard Lampoon and we really like it. And I said, you read the Harvard Lampoon? And they said, we've been reading it for years but we never saw anything we liked before. So they, uh, they hired Al and me to do a little freelance work while we were in college. And this shows you that Harvard Lampoon was not this kind of pre-professional organization uh, it's become, uh, which was Al and I are writing freelance articles for like three cents a word. And we didn't tell anyone what we were doing. We were so ashamed that we were actually writing comedy professionally because that's just not what you do on the Harvard Lampoon. So we did this on the sly and then they gave us a job right out of college. So Al didn't have to go to med school. And uh, that would be, Al and I just left school and we went to, the Har went to National Lampoon, moved to New York and uh, started writing professionally. So I wish I had a story of struggle uh, for your listeners, but it was really, really easy. Um, so your first job here was, is that with The Tonight Show? Or was that? No. No. Okay. Okay. You, I hope this story is interesting. This is, but this is just my life. I can't make it any better. Uh, there are two guys who were ahead of us at the Harvard Lampoon, two guys named Max Pross and Tom Gamble. And uh, they are beloved comedy writers. So they left uh, the Lampoon and got a job at Saturday Night Live. And these guys, everybody wanted them because they're super funny and, uh, and great guys. And they kept getting job offers and turning them down. So the first job offer they got uh, was to write a movie for Meatloaf. Meatloaf, the singer who just passed away. Uh, Meatloaf wanted to make a movie called Fat Men from Outer Space, and they turned the job down and gave it to Al, offered it to Al and me. And so Al and I, this was our first kind of show business job. We wrote a movie treatment for Meatloaf uh, called Fat Men from Outer Space, and we turned it into Mr. Loaf, because that's what they called him at the office. Mr. Loaf is not in today. And we turned in this, uh, our our movie treatment and they said come back next week and you'll get your check and we came back next week and the offices were deserted they were bored up 
uh, boarded up. Ms. Meatloaf had skipped town to avoid paying us the three thousand dollars for the movie treatment. So, uh, but that was our first show business job, and then uh, a few months later, Max and Tom, these guys got a job offer to work on them to be punch up guys writing jokes on the set of a movie called airplane two airplane one of the greatest comedies ever airplane two not so much and so they got this job offer and turned it down and uh, recommended us and al and i i mean if there's a secret to my career it's we never turn down anything al and i literally accepted any job that came our way uh so airplane two we had done some work on the side for them and then they called one day and said we need you on the set will you come out here tomorrow and al and i went into national lampoon and we quit our jobs that morning we ran out on our lease it's a complete dick move i mean we it was a terrible thing but we saw this golden opportunity and we jumped at it so Within 24 hours, we had quit our jobs, run out of our homes, flown out to uh, L.A. from New York, and were on the set of Airplane 2. And they kept us in this hot wooden box, like a sweat box, on the set. And we were there writing jokes as they shot the movie. Oh, right. So right at the time to add to the script as they were going. Yeah, it was fun. You know, it was good. They wanted to make it better. It it was it was a strange job and it's a strange movie and that you don't you know that was a movie of jokes it wasn't a movie of characters and you don't usually do a sequel to that kind of movie and it, it, at least in the old days there are a lot of classic comedies you didn't do another one of you know the comedy it was an original thing and it stood on its own and that's why there was never an Animal House 2. Animal House, biggest comedy in history. They never made a sequel to that. So it was it was a strange thing. They the, It was sort of run by the studio. They didn't know what worked in Airplane uh, to copy in Airplane 2. So a very strange thing they did is they brought back all the same extras. All the seats on the airplane are the same people from the first movie, just because... They didn't know what worked. Um, so that was it. And that movie came out and it was it was a real dud. And suddenly we were lost and bereft. Al and I are in Hollywood. We had no real good credit. I should just move on to say, Airplane 2 has risen in people's uh, uh, esteem. And it's, it's one of Quentin Tarantino's favorite movies. And I, I heard him. On an interview where he's going, yes, I worked in the theater and I really loved Airplane 2. And the host kept saying, I think you mean Airplane. He goes, no, I like Airplane 2. So I haven't, I haven't really had the guts to watch the movie again in about 25 years. Maybe it's okay. But so uh, just to continue the story, Al and I are in L.A. We don't know anyone. We've just written a bad movie. Uh and we're out of work and Al starts applying to business school. He applies to business school and gets in. I think he got into Harvard Business School and I just didn't have a plan. I didn't have a clue. And uh, I think then uh, that's when The Tonight Show came along. And it's, this is a very sweet story, which was our boss from National Lampoon in New York who we had quit. We had really screwed the guy over. He had gotten a job offer from The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and he didn't want to leave New York, but he recommended us. He recommended the guys who had just run out like thieves in the night. So that that was very sweet. And yeah, we got a job on The Tonight Show, and uh, it was very, uh, it was good. I mean, it was a, it's a legendary show, and it was very, very, very hard work where they just had a quota to write 60 jokes a day. And it was grueling. I mean, we would write these jokes, grind them out all day long. And at the end of the day, you had nothing left in you. And uh, uh, that was it. And I was a single man and I was dating back then. I would try and go on dates 
but I had nothing left in in me. All the comedy had been wrung out of me, and we just kind of sit there like a zombie. People probably had high expectations as well on these dates because <laughs> they knew you're a comedy writer. Yeah. So the consistency I'm picking up on is that each time you get a job, it's because somebody's recommended you. Yes, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's it helps to just be kind of nice people, but it's not even. Yeah, I guess it is. It's somebody somebody said they're okay and that's it al and i i mean you know we're both small town kids and i think we're eager to please and work very hard and i hope don't have big egos so people like having us around and uh we always take the job seriously i'll tell i have to tell you this story from the tonight show which was we got hired at the tonight show with Johnny Carson, if the name means anything in Australia. I don't think it does. But uh, we got hired for 13 weeks, and we start on the job. And the first thing they say to us on the job is, uh, welcome to the show. You're, you'll be fired in 13 weeks. And, we, and it turns out the position we were in, uh, they just kept firing the people who had it every 13 weeks. Johnny Carson... Uh, his beloved American entertainer is a very unhappy man, and he loved to fire people. So, so Al and I worked hard, and again, we were kind of nice to have around. So we hung in there for a year and a half. You know, nobody thought we'd make it past the 13, but we kept getting rehired. And then one day, arbitrarily, the producer calls us into our office, his office, and he said, Mr. Carson is not happy, and you will be fired at the termination of your contract in six weeks. So we said, okay. And we went back to work and just kept writing every day and writing every day. And the head writer one day calls us in. He says, guys, I want to tell you, uh, uh, Johnny's not happy. And I think your jobs may be on the line. And we said, they're not on the line. We got fired three weeks ago and we're just running out your contract. And he's, he said, you got fired and you keep coming in your into work. Uh, and we said, well, we got six weeks left on the contract. And he couldn't believe that. I guess nobody had ever done that before. So we got fired from the Tonight Show. And then two weeks later, they called us back, said, you want to come back? Carson wants you back. And it's like, well, gee, I guess I became a much better writer in those two weeks. But again, it's just the lesson of, just keep working. Do your yeah. job. Be a good employee. This is they're paying you. It's supposed to be pleasant to be around. And yeah. Well, yeah. I don't want to oversize, but I have this sense of people listening at home. They go, I don't think he's that pleasant. <laughs> so. We'll move on to The Simpsons. So there is a few shows between there, but um, so that was you hired in 1989. Yes, because yeah. Max and Tom turned down the job. Okay. That was, the third and best job they ever turned down. Um, and they they turned down The Simpsons to work on a show on Showtime called The Boys, which uh, just came and went very quickly. Nobody really remembers that. Uh, and we did The Simpsons. I'm sure they were kicking themselves. They went on. Uh, we went on to work. with. They recommended us again, I guess. Before that, we we had worked for Gary Shandling. We'd worked together on the Gary Shandling. It's not the Larry Sanders show, but uh, his sitcom before that, it's Gary Shandling show. Uh, and then that was it. They turned down The Simpsons. We took it. They went on to work for Seinfeld for many years, and now they're at The Simpsons. So finally, it all, it all came together, and we wound up working together, and they they got the job. They had turned down really like 20 years before. So, okay, we're up to The Simpsons, which I'm yeah. sure is all anyone cares about. And um, I hope they've gotten through this far. Yeah, well, I hope you don't get sick of all this, the same questions about The Simpsons over and over. Um, no, I don't. I, I love to talk about it because I'm a very bad conversationalist, but it's like I know the answers to these things. Obviously, you started that show. Was there a lot of pressure there, or was that something that was um, at this time quite, you know, because it wasn't well known when you started, you didn't feel the big pressure? It's 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 unbelievable to put yourself in the mindset. This was 1988, which was 
Max and Tom turned down the job at The Simpsons because everybody turned it down. Nobody wanted to work on this show. The Simpsons had been one minute shorts on the Tracy Ullman show. And they were taking this gamble to kind of turn it into a half hour show. And there, there'd never been an animated show for adults. Uh, there hadn't been animation in prime time in 30 years, not since the Flintstones. And, uh, and it was on the Fox network, which was a brand new network, had a very bad reputation for just kind of sleazy entertainment. Uh, so nobody wanted this job. So we took it. Al and I are working, you know, helping create the entire world and all the characters. Uh, and we didn't tell anyone what we were doing. I was really ashamed. I think I was newly married and I would go home and apologize to my wife. Well, I'm writing a cartoon. This is the best job I could get. And And the really telling thing about The Simpsons was that the show was created of the, of the eight original writers on the show. Al and I are the only ones who had ever written a half hour script before. The, it was because they had trouble getting writers. They, you know, one guy was an advertising man and one guy was a sports writer and uh, the rest of them had just worked in sketch comedy or late night talk shows. So, uh, it was, you know, it was just a, a coalition of the willing. It was people willing to work on this show. One of the writers, a just a brilliant guy, Jake Kogan, uh, his father was a famous comedy writer and his father was begging him, don't take this job. People thought, people just didn't think the show wouldn't succeed, but, uh, you know, they somehow thought it was career suicide. So that was it. That was the conditions under which we were writing The Simpsons. It was just a summer job and we just had fun. It was one of the most fun jobs I ever had because we didn't take it that seriously. And we were putting things in the show we never thought we'd never seen on TV, but we didn't care because we thought nobody would watch it. And we just enjoyed ourselves. And that made be the secret of the show. Um, how long did it take to become a hit? The show became a hit immediately. That was the thing. We, uh, I tell the story a lot, which was we'd work that first season. You know, you make animation and you kind of have to make the entire first season before you show any of it. You know, it's not like a regular sitcom where you make them and they're on TV three weeks later. So we'd spend a you know a summer, three or four months making the first thirteen episodes, and uh, and in fact, I, I'll go a little longer with this, which was you make the episodes, you record them, it goes into rough animation, then it gets back to final animation, and then the first episode came back fully animated from Korea, South Korea, where the show is animated. And we had a big gathering of uh, the, the writers and producers and the Fox executives who had just gambled, you know, $13 million on this project without seeing a minute of footage. And they watched the first episode of The Simpsons and it's horrible. It looks bad. It doesn't get a laugh. The show is a disaster. And the, the episode ends and the lights come up in the screening room and the Nobody knows what to say. And one of the writers, Wally Wallodarsky, goes, show it again. So that episode was so messed up that we couldn't premiere. We were supposed to premiere in September uh, with that episode, and we couldn't show it. And so they, we just said, we need more time to fix these episodes. And we wound up showing a premiering with a Christmas episode. It, it was supposed to be episode nine, but uh, it became our first episode, Simpsons Roasting on an Open Fire. And we had a premiere party for the show in a bowling alley. Fox, again, Fox had so little uh, faith in the show that our, our premiere party was in a bowling alley. I mean, it was like a kid's birthday party. They'd sprung about 40 bucks for the whole thing. And we're sitting there bowling and drinking beer. 
And then at eight o'clock, The Simpsons is premiering and they show it on those screens where they usually project your bowling score. And we sit there and we're watching the show and I could see it went across the room. We're going, oh my God, this is good. And uh, I, we were all surprised how good that first episode was. And then the head of publicity comes in with reviews from all over the country, which had been faxed to us. That's how old The Simpsons is. There's no internet or cell phones. We just got a bunch of reviews faxed to us. And they were saying, oh, this is a brilliant show. You know, this is a game changer in TV. So the critics picked up on it. And then the next morning we go into work and find out we had debuted to the highest ratings in the history of the Fox network. So that was it. The show was an instantaneous hit. Uh, a couple of weeks later, I think it was the number three show in the ratings. Uh, and then we were on the cover of Newsweek. It, it was instantaneous how, how popular the show was. And nobody, literally nobody involved saw it coming. Why do you think it was so popular so fast? Uh, I don't know. Uh, the, the basic answer is I don't know. Um, I think it just hit things just right. Like an, a, a, a parallel note was that was the year in movies that The Little Mermaid came out. And in, in Disney movies for decades, for 20 or 30 years, were just kiddie entertainment. And, you know, they were just considered kind of junk programming and the, the studio had been in decline. And then suddenly... They put out The Little Mermaid and grown-ups were going to see cartoons. And that movie was a blockbuster hit, obviously, and started this whole renaissance, you know, uh, in Disney animated films like Beauty and the Beast, I think came out the next year. So there was something just in the air. We hit it right where people were suddenly willing to watch animation and it moved fast too. TV was very, very slow and kind of ossified at the time. I always tell the story, which is true, which was the most outrageous show on TV at the time The Simpsons came on was The Golden Girls. Just these four old ladies shuffling around in an apartment. And then suddenly The Simpsons come on and it's bright and colorful and it moved really fast and it would be a mix of smart jokes and stupid jokes. And there was something in there for everybody. Uh, and it caught people off guard. I think the other great thing about the show was, you know, we, we had the means to make it funny and brash and original, but we had James L. Brooks in there who just knew how to make it touching. I mean, that was really his big contribution to the show was to give it heart and, you know, the Simpsons could be frantic and Homer could be a jerk and terrible. And then he said, just give us five seconds of Homer feeling really remorseful or the family being really mad at him. And that worked. That worked so very well. And that is, that is really just the key to the success of the show. I sometimes uh, when I watch shows from the 80s that were out, pro like sitcoms prior to The Simpsons, the father character is normally a moral, ethical person who does the right thing and pretty much teaches and guides the family. So sometimes I wonder if Homer almost being a, like an anti-hero and not that father was one of the reasons it may have been successful because people probably wanted to see their own father. Yes, I yeah. think that so. And I mean, you know, when, when I was working on The Simpsons, Fox had one other hit before we came along. It's funny, I, I always like to say, the Simpsons was spun off from the Tracy Ullman show, which was the lowest rated show on television. It was number 100 out of 100 TV shows on the air. But Fox had a one, one hit with Married with Children. That preceded us by two years. And uh, the original title for Married with Children was not the Cosby show. They just wanted to be a reaction to what was the number one show in America year after year after year, the Cosby show. And in fact, when we were working on that first season of The Simpsons, I just thought critics were going to dismiss it and just call it a cartoon version of Married with Children. Uh, but they were the first ones to try it, just to go, let's 
you know, let's flip the script here and let's turn the sentiments and make uh, make this kind of horrible family that's still a family. And I remember watching that show when it debuted and just being floored. I loved it. It was so funny. And it, it was just what I thought TV needed. So we we weren't really blazing new trails with The Simpsons, but nobody's nobody's ever uh, seemed to have picked up on that. We owe that show a great, great debt. Quickly thinking of it as I asked the question, but you know there are obviously the differences with the animation and um, yeah, the animation yeah. certainly gave us big opportunities. You know, the other thing about TV is it had gotten really, really lazy and as I say ossified because in the early days of TV right up to the 60s you know TV used to be like little movies if you know shows like Bewitched or uh, I Dream of Jeannie you know there were special effects it was shot on film uh, it would go from scene to scene to scene and you know there'd be complicated stories and then um especially All in the Family came along. All in the Family, biggest hit in America for about five or six years. I think it's the greatest show in TV history, but it was just people sitting in a living room talking and everybody copied that. Every single TV show right up through Cosby was just people sitting in a living room talking, nothing happened. And that's what TV became. And uh, so then The Simpsons come along and, hey, they're going on adventures. And, hey, here's a movie parody in the middle and a, a musical number. And it, I think it really kind of can told, it not only gave people more, but it, it reminded TV writers, hey, try harder, you know, do more, go places. And TV became much faster paced and more interesting after that. Well, I imagine with it being animation too, you can stretch that universe, uh, the Simpsons universe out a lot more. Yes, I mean, it's, it was a real gift of the, of the form that we could do more, but it, and it was also incumbent upon you to make use of it. You know, you couldn't do a lazy show uh, when you had this opportunity to go anywhere and, you know, move as fast as you can. It's, it's an interesting story in that, the second script Al and I were hired to write on The Simpsons, it was James L. Brooks came to us and said, uh, all right, here's the plot. Lisa is sad. That's what he gave. And Lisa is sad and she's moping around all the time. And uh, we just said, oh, we're dead. Al thought they're going to fire us off of this because how do you do an animated show about a person sad? Uh, and that became Moaning Lisa. It's the episode that introduced Bleeding Gums Murphy. And it is, you know, to date, it's really not, it's funny because I think today is the 33rd anniversary of that show airing. And, uh, and you know, it's not, it's not an animation tour de force. It's, you could very easily have shot that whole episode on film and the TV budget. Uh, but it was very powerful. It was very moving, thanks to James L. Brooks's input. And that was a watershed moment for The Simpsons, too. That was, you know, it was probably episode three or four where it was just powerfully moving. Uh, and it was it was about Lisa. It wasn't about Bart. It wasn't about Homer. And people really loved it. Oh, I saw that one as a child, roughly probably a tiny bit younger than Lisa and related to it as a child and then I've seen it as a mother and then felt very sorry I wanted to help Lisa if like I've seen, you know you sort of grow with the show as well oh, that's good I hope it is it good I haven't wa yeah. literally <laughs> seen it since it aired yeah definitely um yeah that's one of the things and the jokes as well um I don't know you know as you probably know you see them as a child and then you see them as a teenager a young adult and you get different jokes each time and sometimes I wonder what jokes I'm still yet to get. Yeah, there may yeah. be a few not in there. We were really impressed when the show came on the air. Again, there wasn't even the internet. There were chat rooms online, you know, just these, these texts that would go back and forth. And we would see it was our first vision of what the internet would become in that 
uh, there were geeks watching The Simpsons and they caught every reference. There was nothing so obscure we did uh, that they didn't catch it. And it made us really feel appreciated. It made us feel like, gee, all this hard work we're putting in uh, is being, uh, being appreciated. The other thing, just uh, one last point, The Simpsons came on the air at the same time home recording came uh, came around. Everybody in America had a VCR and could tape a show and watch it again. And so we said, oh, gee, let's, uh, let's put jokes in the show you won't catch the first time. Let's give people a reason to tape it and watch it again and watch it in slow motion. And, you know, there would never have been a point to doing that before people could tape a show. So that was another reason we decided to put more jokes in the background. Uh, Got some um, fan-based questions. Is that all right if sure. I ask you some of those? Absolutely. So, so Anthony Long wants to know, and I've got to ask his question because he's agreed to be in my comedy show on the weekend. Um, okay. What was it like to work with a legend like Sam Simon? Sam Simon, uh, he was great. He was just the most he is, uh, you know, I've worked with a lot of great people for, you know, 40 years. I'm so old. He was the best. He was the the best master of sitcoms I'd ever seen. And he was so very funny and he loved to make it fun. And, you know, he loved to, you know, we would work with him all day and then go out to the movies afterwards and we'd smoke cigars. And the job was really fun. And he was a great guy if he liked you. And if he didn't like you, if you, it, what it was is Sam was so great. And if you weren't doing your job, if you weren't giving it your all, he would be ruthless. He could be very mean. He would yell at people. So a lot of people hated him. I mean, he was a very, very hated man. And he knew it. A lot of people wouldn't work with him in Hollywood. But, you know... If you did your job, he couldn't have been sweeter. He couldn't have been a nicer man. And uh, so that was great. And I, I don't know, we just learned so much by osmosis just working with him. Mike Mackler, this is actually a pretty good question. Who's your favorite guest star to work with? Oh, uh, that's interesting. I loved, I certainly loved Phil Hartman. I loved him. He would come in and just nail everything. He would be in and out. I always tell the story that he lived in Malibu and it took him 90 minutes to drive into the Simpsons and he would come in and record all his lines, bang, 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 bang. They were all perfect. Uh, and he was done in five minutes and then he had to get back in his car and drive 90 minutes back. So he was great. Uh, I, I mentioned we've had 800 guest stars on the show and there's only four people nobody liked. And that was it. People, the guest stars are all great. They're all, you know, they're excited to be there. It's a fun job. It's they like to see the cast and see these these human beings that do the voices of all these cartoon characters. So they're happy to be there, and it's an easy gig. So I like them. You know, John Lovitz was a guest I loved having on. He he made me laugh so much that we wound up creating a whole show for him. It's the critic. This is the critic. Yeah. But, you know, one secret of The Simpsons that took me 30 years to realize is one reason the show succeeds and goes on and on is it's a nice place to work. You know, the writers are all nice. The actors are all nice. The animators are, are really good and easy to work with and like to collaborate and never complain. Every, you know, it's just a happy, happy ship. And when I would, I, I, I realized that, and then I would go back and read books about other, you know, long running TV shows and something, a show like MASH was a job. People love to go in and work there in the morning and the cast are all still friends. And somehow that comes through. I mean, it, you know, there are idiots there and by idiots, I mean, uh, TV scholars who seem to think good comedy and good writing comes out of friction and creative chaos. And it's like, no, you know, nothing good comes out of friction. It's, you know, good work comes from a happy work environment where people get along and 
respect each other and are willing to work together. And that's The Simpsons. Andy Sorensen said, are there any memorable stories from fans about how The Simpsons has affected them in a personal way? So anything that sticks out in your mind? No, no. There are no. no, the fans are all nice. They just appreciate the show. An interesting show. Uh, when I work on other sitcoms, people would always come up with ideas. They always go, oh, you should do this with Alfred. Sledgehammer should do this. You know, and certainly the poor people at Seinfeld were just besieged with everyone going, oh, this happened to me. You should do it. It would never happen with The Simpsons. And I, I think it was sort of a way of respect that people would say, wow, that's good. I'm not, I'm not going to try and do that. I'll just stay home and watch it. Chris, what is your favorite character to write for? Uh, I like Homer. Homer, you know, it's such an obvious answer, but uh, Homer is a comedy writer's dream because he has everything wrong with him. He's fat, he's bald, he's lazy, he's angry, he's a drunk. And in season four, we wrote a joke where he goes to a pet shop and the pet shop owner goes, ooh, what is that smell? And... Uh, and one of the writers goes, oh, I guess Homer smells now, too. I've heard that he was sort of written um, almost like the personality of a, of a dog, like a pet dog. Is that correct? That's it. It's John Swartzwelder who has written 60 episodes of The Simpsons. You know, he's written three full years. It never hit me before. Three full seasons of The Simpsons written by this one, you know, eccentric writer John Swartzwelder lovely lovely guy and we said and he loved writing Homer he would turn in these scripts and we go we'd read them and go well gee it's really funny but there's there's no Lisa and Marge in the show and you go what is the problem with that he just loved Homer and he said his secret was to write Homer like a big dog and you you can suddenly see it yeah Homer he's just all enthusiasm and then all misery you know his his his, uh, his his emotions are just at the extremes he seems to have like a dog he seems to have no long-term memory so I thought that was pretty apt I like that next travels where is the best place you've traveled to okay yeah so, so maybe we should have a segue here I do a podcast called uh what am I doing here? And it's about my travels. I re anyone who's listened this far and wants to hear more of this voice, please listen to my podcast. I beg you. There's, it's called What Am I Doing Here? It's only 15 minutes long. It's produced, you know, it's, re it's written and rehearsed and acted. So it's not every you know there i just read there are two and a half million podcasts out there that's what we're dealing with and uh they, this is something i work really hard on so anyway it's called what am i doing here and it comes from the fact that i have been to 136 countries and i you know when you look at me you go with well, this schmuck he's been to 136 countries and I've climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and I've been to the North Pole and the South Pole. And uh, I had a lot of funny stories about it. And it was just to tie it into The Simpsons. Every week uh, I would come into The Simpsons and they'd go, what did you do on your day off? And I said, oh, we went to North Korea or we went to Iraq and that kind of thing. And one of The Simpsons writers says, man, you got to do a podcast. You got you don't jump waste these stories on me. Do a podcast. I know everyone in the podcast business. I'll get you, I'll get you a good slot. So I went out. I'm like you. I bought two thousand dollars worth of equipment and I wrote these uh, three episodes of the podcast and uh, edited them and and then I sent them to my friend at The Simpsons. He said, "Man, you got to do a podcast." I said, "Here's the podcast. How can you help me?" And he goes. I don't know anybody in podcasts. So I was really mad, but uh, I got the podcast on the air anyway. So that's it. It's, it's 15 minutes of funny travel stories to locations you'd never think of going. Uh, which gets to the question, what's my favorite place I've been? I went to Myanmar, which used to be Burma. And 
Uh, it's an absolutely beautiful country. It's beautiful and has this amazing culture and great food. Uh, and what makes it my favorite place is you go into Myanmar, you don't know anything about it, and you drive four miles and you see some, you see uh, like a statue of Buddha as big as the uh, Statue of Liberty. It's just giant and it's sitting there in the jungle and you never heard of it. And you drive four more miles. There's something else gigantic you never heard of. The country is just full of surprises. And it's, I always say it's like going to Egypt if you had never heard of the pyramids and you go there, whoa, what is that? So I love that. Uh, uh, yeah, I like Myanmar. I like that whole part of the world. I love Laos and Thailand. I've heard you've got a great travel partner. A great, yes, it's all my wife. My wife, who is the judge of the talent show, uh, my, my dear wife, loves to travel and as a kid she went all around the world and she went to places you can't go anymore like Afghanistan so this is what she brought to our marriage I didn't I didn't want to go to any of these places and now I've been everywhere but she loves to travel and I like to make my wife happy and you know it's not it's you know, her ideas are always more dynamic than my ideas. She says, and she'll say, let's go to Libya. And I say, let's sit home and watch TV. That's, uh, so she wins. And, you know, she's given me this very, very excited, exciting life. She's given me a personality. It makes the podcast really good because um, Denise, Mike's wife, will often encourage Mike to do things outside of his comfort zone or break rules. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. She's she's very bold and intrepid, and I am very scared and trepid. And uh, she leads us on a lot of adventures. And she's in the podcast playing herself again. It's scripted, and I'll bring her in, and I say, "You got to read these lines." And she'll read them. She go, "Wait, this really happened?" And I go, "Yeah." I mean, the podcast is is funny and amazing, and it's one hundred percent true. Really good. Yeah, have a listen. Is it the? It's got a very high rating, doesn't it? It's high. Yes. The. I mean, it's only. A, it's funny, but nobody knows it's out there, and I know there are millions of podcasts I'm competing with, and but it's it's never gotten one inch of coverage in the media, so I, I think that would really help. But I just can't get anyone to notice it. But the people who who listen to it love it. It's only gotten five star reviews. It is good. It literally is the highest rated podcast out there. It's a, it's got a four point nine rating out of five. So people who listen to it like it. It's very good. And there's also the book, which is also a great read as well. Thank you very much, well, thank Mike. You. Yeah. Thank you. I had a lot of fun. I hope it wasn't too boring. Uh yeah, read my books and listen to my podcast, and that's my entire life. You never have to talk to me in person. <laughs> yeah, we're super grateful to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on a great episode of Great Comedic Minds. We'll be back next week, so be sure to tune in. Also, like, share, subscribe to the channel, and be sure to follow Carl Robertson on Instagram.